Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to the second of a series of public events to mark the celebration of CERN's 70th anniversary. I'm Mike Lamont, Director of Accelerators and Technology here at CERN, and I'm very happy to introduce today's event, which we'll be talking about the interesting and uh, intricate relationship between particle physics and medicine. So as the Le European Laboratory for Particle Physics, our main mission here at CERN is to understand the most fundamental particles and the laws of the universe. Now, as you might imagine, this throws up a few challenges. Um, but we also have a commitment besides this uh, to ensure societal impact stemming from the innova innovative applications of the technology that underpins our efforts. And there really is quite some technology and engineering here at CERN. It, what we do is difficult, and we're really pushing the boundaries of a wide variety of different uh, technologies and engineerings. And as an offshoot of this, medical applications are a great example. And we have a wide ranging uh, initiatives ranging, ranging th through a wide variety of subjects. You hear about some of them this evening. So hadron therapy, so cancer therapy with protons or light ions, medical imaging, the production of novel radioisotopes for medical research, and uh, more recently, innovative flash therapy for cancer treatment using high energy electrons. So before inviting on the stage this evening's host, Professor Antoine Geisbuller, he's Dean of the F Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva and Director of Teaching and Re of Research and Head of Division of eHealth and Telemedicine at the Uni Hospital, University Hospital of Geneva. Let's set the stage with a video summarizing how developments and discoveries in physics since the end of the 19th century of fueled innovation in medicine. So thank you very much. The Large Hadron Collider, the largest and most complex tool of modern physics, 27 kilometers circumference, 100 meters below ground, accelerating and colliding beams of particles whizzing around at nearly the speed of light. What for? To study the structure of the universe and its underlining principles. To accomplish this feat, scientists invented new technologies that were unimaginable just decades ago. This process has led to innovations in many fields and sometimes disruptive revolutions that have changed our lives. Medicine is a prime example. Ever since William Conrad Rentgen's accidental discovery of X-ray in 1895 and their immediate application to look inside the human body and then treat cancer, physics research has fueled medical innovations. A year later, Henry Becquerel discovered natural radioactivity in uranium, a spontaneous decay process through which some elements emit energy, or radiation, in the form of particles. Soon after, Pierre Curie and Maria Skłodowska curie discovered two new and highly radioactive elements, radium and polonium. Applications of radium salts were very quickly used to treat surface or body cavity tumors. Even some of the most fundamental physics discoveries have found their way into the hospital. Antimatter, a mirror twin of ordinary matter, is not just the subject of science fiction movies. It's also not something that is only found in physics laboratories. The anti-electrons, or positrons, that were postulated by Paul Dirac in 1928 and discovered by Carl Anderson in 1932, are actually used in a special type of medical imaging. Positron emission tomography, or PET, allows doctors to identify anomalies in the metabolic activity of the body, and hence to diagnose various diseases. L'idea di utilizzare queste particelle accelerate o da ciclotroni o da sincrotroni per la terapia del cancro è dovuta a un grande fisico, Bob Wilson. In 1946, Robert Wilson, first director of Fermilab, 
proposed to use protons for cancer radiotherapy. Protons can target tumors more precisely than X-rays since they release most of their radioactive dose in the so-called BRAC peak. Today, particle accelerators, particle detectors, computing and data analysis methods are ubiquitous in hospitals and medical research centers. Conventional radiotherapy with X-rays is widely available at low cost. A limited number of facilities worldwide offer radiotherapy with protons and an even smaller number with carbon ions, allowing to treat some of the most challenging types of tumors. New technological options are being explored to make particle therapy more widespread and affordable. New treatment modalities will also become possible, such as flash radiotherapy. Particle accelerator technology also supports nuclear medicine, which uses radioactive substances called radioisotopes for treatment and diagnosis of many diseases. A large fraction of these radioisotopes is still produced by research reactors built in the 50s and the 60s, and particle accelerators are becoming a viable option to ensure a steady supply of medical radioisotopes. Accelerator-based installations can produce innovative medical radioisotopes, which can provide more personalized diagnosis and treatment options. The first time a PET image was ever taken at CERN of a small animal was in 1977. Today, PET scanners use detectors based on scintillating crystals, similar to the ones used in particle physics experiments. And thanks to technologies developed initially for the LHC experiments, X-ray imaging has moved from black and white to color, providing more information. Computing and simulation techniques developed for particle physics have already been adopted in medicine. For example, to develop radiotherapy treatment plans or to simulate complex biological systems. Artificial intelligence provides new opportunities, from spotting anomalies in brain imaging, to optimizing cancer screening or stroke management, to preserving patient data privacy. For more than a century, Research in nuclear and particle physics has acted as a trailblazer for disruptive technologies, which in turn have enabled crucial innovations in medicine. This collaboration is far from over. Wow. Quite amazing. I don't know about you, but it always puts stars in my eyes to, to see this. Thank you, Mike, for the, the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Antoine Geisbuller. I'm a professor of medicine, and on behalf of the University of Geneva and the Geneva University Hospitals that I represent, I'm really proud to be here tonight and facilitate uh, the discussions that are going to take place around particle physics and medicine. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to host this second event uh, of CERN, uh, 70th anniversary tonight, because the subject we are presenting is very close to my heart. 40 years ago, I was a young medical student and I was looking for a job at the hospital in Geneva, and I was hired by one of the guys you've seen in the video, uh, Dave Townsend, uh, to work on a technology that I had never heard of, positron emission tomography, PET. And he was a physicist. I didn't even know there were physicists in hospitals. And then I really discovered how important innovation, technological development, and working together between physicists and physicians was key to progress in, in medicine. During the three years I worked as a medical student in, in uh, positron emission tomography, I had the chance to discover a bit more about CERN. I ended up uh, meeting and exchanging with uh, people like George Scharfbach, who, who eventually became a, a Nobel Prize winner. And as I was a geek doing some computer science at that time, I even had the privilege of working on one of those fancy supercomputers, the Cray XMP, which at that time was something just unbelievable for, for uh, uh, someone doing uh, computer science. So tonight, we're going to be looking at some of the innovations that have changed the way we practice medicine, and those innovations have been uh, fueled by research and by developments done here at CERN. 
we'll have a first session focusing on accelerators. As you know, we have here at CERN huge accelerators, but smaller versions can actually be used in medicine and uh, provide very interesting and advanced solutions for treating cancers. So that's going to be the first session. The second session is going to be focused on how we build new detectors that can actually help build machines that are looking inside the body. Scanners, uh, CT scanners or PET scanners and we're going to hear about the new developments in this field uh, as they are uh, developed here uh, at CERN. And the last part is going to deal with new developments in data science, in artificial intelligence, in machine learning, in digital medicine, and how those digital tools, some of which have been pioneered here uh, at CERN and which are used on a daily basis here at CERN, can actually be used in medicine and make a huge difference. So that's the menu for tonight, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. The first session is going to be on accelerators to treat cancer. And I'll request the presence of Ugo and Manjit on stage, please. Welcome, Manjit. Manjit, you are a visiting professor at the University of Oxford, and you were a former senior advisor for medical applications at CERN. And Ugo, Ugo, you are the president of the Terra Foundation. I think we've seen you in the, in the movie. And uh, we have a third person joining us, unfortunately only by uh, video. I think there were some travel problems uh, from Germany. Uh, Esther, Esther, you're the chair of the Department of Radiotherapy and Radiation Oncology at the University Hospital and Faculty of Medicine at the Dresden University of Technology. Thank you for joining us remotely. Manjit, we heard in the video that Robert Wilson was the first to propose to use proton, protons for cancer radiotherapy. But this year is also the 70th anniversary since the first patient was treated with protons at Berkeley, right? That's right. Why and was it at Berkeley? Because Ernest Lawrence invented the cyclotron in Berkeley in 1931, and Bob Wilson was his protege and student, and Bob Wilson used the cyclotron at Berkeley to look at the profiles of the particles, and he did that in 1946, and it was those profiles that led to the very famous paper which you will hear more about throughout this session. And, and it was the combination of the fact that there was a cyclotron invented, Bob Wilson did the profiles, and Ernest Lawrence's brother was a medical doctor, okay. John. And, the, and they really wanted to collaborate together, not just accelerator physics and medicine separately, but really physics, medicine, chemistry, and so on. And they set up the very first biomedical laboratory called the Donna Biomedical Laboratory in Berkeley. And it was no accident that all of this led to the first patient being treated. And we will hear more about this in September 1954 in Berkeley, the same protons we accelerated our Large Hadron Collider. And just by amazing coincidence, CERN was also founded in September 1954. And I'm really happy to be here and also had the fortune of being both at Berkeley and at CERN. And mostly my Hadron therapy is due to Professor Maldi. We will hear a little bit more. And the, the laboratory they set up the Donna Laboratory is where I actually had my office and my lab. So it's, okay. it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Everything seems to be a bit it connected. Seems to become connected, yes. yes. So Hugo, from a physics perspective, what makes X-rays, protons, and other ions different, and why this is important once you use them to treat uh, the human body? Yes, from a physicist perspective, right, so not the biology, which is very complicated, but from the physics point of view, X-rays, when they get into the body of a patient, they get through and 30% of the energy goes through. These X-rays are like uh, photons, uh, photons, like the ones of light, but uh, one million times more energetic. And so they're penetrating the body much more than light. And uh, 
this is an inconvenient because the fact that uh, uh, tissues before and afterwards uh, the tumor are irradiated poses a problem and this is solved today very well by making many beams uh, crossing on the tumors, nine, twelve sometimes, so that you have a dose, as we call it, energy per cubic uh, millimeter of tissue given to the, which is more elevated in the tumor ta uh, target and much less all around. Instead, hedons, that is charged particles which are produced uh, by the accelerators we'll talk later on, penetrating in matter stop and they have this peak when they stop. The slower they go while stopping, the higher energy they transfer to the matter. So uh, the matter uh, gets more dose at the end. We call it Bragg peak or Bragg spot, which is kind of a small spot of one centimeter diameter in the case of protons and half a centimeter diameter in the case of carbon ions. It's smaller in case of carbon ions. And this makes a difference because with the modern technologies we have developed at CERN in many laboratories working in particle physics, you can move the beam, change the energy with a system of controls which are very sophisticated but now work very well. And so you can move the spot in depth by changing the energy and laterally by changing magnetic fields. So you can paint a tumor and you give just the dose in the right place. Now, the major point that I want to stress here, which is very important, is that while protons, from the point of view of the chemistry and the radiobiology they produce in the tumor and in the tissues, which are not uh, tumor tissues, uh, healthy tissues, are similar to the effects that X-rays do, carbon ions, uh, other ions, also light ions, as we call them, oxygen, others, when they penetrate, they have a very different uh, biological effect because a proton passes to the DNA of, uh, for instance, of uh, a uh, cell, and at maximum, if it passes, can produce one break or a double strand break. Instead, the carbon ion produces 25 times more electron uh, stripping than a proton, so strips much many more electrons and produces multiple irreparable breaks. And so the very important message that I want you to carry, carry home is that carbon and oxygen ions of this type have a different nature, are a different type of radiation, and so they can cure, and this we'll say later on possibly, radioresistant tumors, for instance, which resist both to X-rays and protons. Well, thank you for those explanations. And uh, Esther, you, you work in a, in a hospital, so maybe you can tell us a bit more about the medical aspects of this uh, uh, theory uh, and, uh, and how uh, this relates to, to radiotherapy. Yes, sure, certainly. Thank you very much. So there are different types that we just heard of uh, irradiation. And mostly in the clinic, we use photon irradiation. So there are about eight thousand departments of radiotherapy worldwide and they use photons mainly as a part of 180 particle centers that use photons or carbon ions or oxygen that we just heard. So most treatments really are still done with photons. And these photons, as we also heard, they produce um, electrons inside the body and these electrons travel to the DNA inside the cells. And in this DNA, the damage is caused. And by doing this damage in tumor cells, the tumor cells get suicide. And based on suicide, they then pass away. So we don't have to take out the, the tumor, but it dissolves itself. And it just leaves scar tissue, if any, that's a remnant afterwards. Um, most of those treatments are given from external beam irradiation. So this is really the workhorse of what we do. But we have to be careful that we don't harm the normal tissue that surrounds the uh, tumor that we treat. And this can be lung tissue, it can be the heart, it can be the spinal cord. All this has to be taken very carefully into account. And we use multiple beams to make this possible, but we also have to 
so that we reduce the dose there. So we have constraints that we have to take into account when making those treatments. What's if we that? then move, yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. If we then move to, um, let's say, protons, they're quite different. We heard about this break peak. We heard about the very distinct moment where opposition, where the radiation dose is delivered. And for proton therapy, we can hope, often just have two or three beams from three or four directions, or two, two or three directions, sorry, and they get together at one point. They deliver all the dose scanning technique that was just alluded to, and we can avoid the dose that goes beyond this focal break peak. So by using this technique, especially in brain tumor patients or patients with tumor next to the spinal cord, or also in pediatric patients and children that we treat, uh, we can reduce the dose substantially and also then cause lesser side effects, for instance, growth retardation, or cognitive side effects if we treat uh, brain tumors. This really makes a big difference uh, in the course of the patient's um, well-being after treatment. Well, thank you for those explanations. So if I summarize, we now have a very advanced technique that can help choose exactly where we want to put the energy that is going to be destroying the cancer that we try to, to treat without depositing energy elsewhere and therefore not harming the other tissues that we want to spare. Is this something that can be applied to any kind of tumor or does it have to be, is it uh, more relevant to certain kinds of tumors? So when we talk about the side effects, it's most important for those patients that we treat with a curative intent. So those patients that have a long life expectancy and that we want to cure from the disease that they have. So in general terms, we deli don't deliver protons or particles in general to patients that have a palliative treatment where we have to take away pain or bleeding because of a short period that they still live because they are not going to encounter side effects of that strength that is possible to use protons or particles. We have to be slightly restricted because we only have 180 sites, so we can't treat every patient on those machines. That's why we have to make choices. I talked about the brain tumors, um, so tumors next to radiosensitive tissues, they are often treated with particles. The children, as well, so that's also really a firm indication. And other structures like, like a lung tumor, esophageal cancer, patients with tumors in their lower abdomen, they are all treated using, or often treated using a protons. But because of this scanning, you heard that earlier on, and possibly also our movement inside the body, so breathing in and breathing out already causes kidneys and pancreas and all sorts of things to move in a body. We have to be very careful that we also deliver those correctly to what we want to treat. So it's also rather tricky. It's not very easy to use protons. And a lot of developments are ongoing in multiple centers, and also obviously also in turn to make this applicable to other um, tumor entities in the future. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we were also supposed to, to be meeting with Dario Bresanini today, but uh, he was also held uh, due to strikes in, in, uh, in Italy. And what's interesting with Dario is that he's not only a researcher, he's also a writer and a science communicator, but he's also a patient, and a patient who was treated by this therapy that we're just discussing, the Hadron therapy. So, as he couldn't come, we will do an interview with him uh, now, uh, with Dario. So Dario. Before getting treated, I didn't know about uh, Hadron therapy. Uh, I had never heard about it. And I was uh, actually quite surprised to know that you can use a particle accelerator uh, against some type of cancer. And I was even more surprised uh, to know that such a facility was uh, less than 60 kilometers from where I live. So Dario, how different was it from what you expected? Or what surprised you the most when you were treated using this uh, new technology? 
After the surgery to insert the tantalium clips into my eye to help focus the proton beam, they explained to me that the procedure was not invasive and that I would not feel any pain. The only problem, they said, uh, could be the claustrophobic sensation given by the facial mask that I had to wear uh, during the treatment. Everything went as expected, but I was surprised when the proton beam was uh, turned on to actually see inside my eye a fluctuating and frightening uh, light blue light moving and dancing. I was terrified because it was not expected. N nobody told me that I should expect uh, this kind of, uh, of, of phenomena. After the treatment, uh, I checked some scientific paper. Um, some say it is a Cherenkov's radiation from the protons that are slowing down um, into the eye and losing energy. Uh, other papers uh, say it's not Cherenkov because uh, uh, the protons uh, do not have enough, uh, enough energy and maybe it's some sort of uh, stimulus uh, to the optical nerve. Anyway, it was quite an experience. Well, obviously, there are still a few mysteries, but we, we heard there were different kinds of possibilities to have a treatment. Why did you choose to have a hadron therapy? ...would be to completely eliminate uh, uh, the eye to eradicate the tumor. So I chose a uh, hadron therapy to save the organ, even if its uh, functionality would be compromised forever uh, due to the unfortunate position of my melanoma just uh, on top of the optical nerve. So Dario, you are a researcher, you are a science communicator, and you're also a patient. Uh, this may be somewhat challenging to be a bit of both. So did you experience some kind of a disconnection between your rational, scientifically trained brain and your emotional self? I'm a scientist, uh, a theoretician, and I consider myself a, a rather rational person. But when I discovered that I had uh, that kind of malignant cancer, I was desperate. I could not think in rational terms, considering the pros and cons uh, of, of the various options, considering the probability of dying and so forth. I even refused to look at the scientific literature um, at the mortality rates for my kind of tumor, and, uh, and I still do. My rationality resurfaced again when I decided to talk in public about uh, my tumor, about what was happening to me, about the cancer, about the treatment. And then you decided to tell your story publicly and even feature it in a book. Why did you do so? After a few months from the treatment, I decided I needed to talk in public about my story, about what I was going through. I had the urge to do it uh, as a cathartic experience. Uh, it was too big a thing for me, and so I needed to tell other people what was happening to me. So I made a YouTube video for my half a million followers, but it was not a detailed description of my feeling and of the whole experience. Then. Two years later, I thought that my, my story could be useful to others, uh, maybe to people that just discovered that they have the same tumor that I have, uh, or maybe even to people who are experiencing the same uh, symptoms, but are maybe underestimating them and they are not doing a proper medical check. And since at the time I was already writing a, a superhero comic book, Dr. Neutron, Dr. Newton is a, he, he's a scientist, a physicist. Uh, it felt natural to have my hero, not Dr. Neutron, uh, to experience my story and going through everything from the discovery of the symptoms to the various medical treatment to what I am doing right now, a periodical follow-up. Well, thank you, Dario, for this uh, testimonial. Uh, and here is one of the uh, pages of the, the book that was published and, and you can see Dario on the bottom right of, of the page uh, being treated by uh, one of these incredible tools. And uh, uh, if we look at uh, one of the accelerators needed to produce those uh, 
and those protons and carbon ions, this is what it looks like. So, Hugo, this looks like science fiction, but it's very much real. Uh, Dario has been treated with protons. The center where he was treated also deliver carbon ions, and these require a much bigger accelerator. Well, let me first say that uh, I was very touched by Dario uh, testimony, not now in Italy when it happened, because this is the accelerator that I happened to design with my collaborators in the Terra Foundation, it's the Knau Center in Pavia, and uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, he was very courageous, and not only this, this has been very beneficial because in Italy his testimony was very well recognized by thousands and thousands, ten hundred of thousands of people, and this is very important because, of course, uh, uh, Often we are scared about cures which uh, can save us. So in this case, his testimony has been very important. Thank you. Now, to go to the questions. Uh, well, m maybe uh, a question uh, I have for you is, you know, looking at, at the map of distribution of these, uh, these centers for hadron therapy, there aren't that many. Uh, and we see that they create a lot of benefit for, for, for treatment of certain kinds of uh, cancer. Uh, how can we make them more widespread? Well, I mean, uh, the point is that uh, uh, it is difficult because of few numbers. May I quote few numbers, Antoine? Mm -hmm. Please. You see, uh, X-rays, the ones that, as I said, as Esther said, are used all over the place here in our town in Geneva, we have maybe 10 of these accelerators. They are linear accelerators, which are so long, a tube of copper, well done, of course, with some power, and they accelerate electrons to energies, let's say 10 MeV, million electron volts. This is a unit of energy that we use here in this kind of building. Of course, LAC is much larger than that, 10 MeV. Electrons, 10 MeV. Then the electrons strike a target, they produce X-rays, and these are used for the treatment as Esther has described, and they say many beams and so on. If you want to make a proton beam that is the simplest of the hadron therapy, the protons, which are the same radiobiological effect as X-rays, as explained, but are much more precise, as you underline, this needs 250 MeV. So 10, 25, 250. But on top of that, the mass of a proton is 2,000 times the mass of an electron. So you imagine what is the difficulty. And for doing that, you need machines which are much bigger. And in particular, you need cyclotrons, typically, which are, in case of normal temperature cyclotron, which is the old-fashioned, about two meters in diameter, many, many hundred tons. If you want to do the same thing, to go to the same depths, 30 centimeters in the body of the patient with carbon ions, you don't need 250 MeV, but 5,000 MeV. That is another factor of 20 more, and the carbon ion is 12 times heavier than the proton, which is 2,000 times heavier than the electron. I hope I have not confused you with all these numbers. No, no, but no, this no, explains, okay. I think, why it is difficult. We must use machines which are very large, very weighty, and using what is called, in our jargon, repeated acceleration. The particles go in the trajectory, and every time they make a turn, they get some energy, so that the, the energy sum up. We cannot do it in one go as we do it for electrons. Okay. In the case of cyclotrons, the, the trajectory is spiral, and from the center to the outside, and then you extract it. In the case of the synchrotron, the magnets are on the circumference, the trajectory is circular, at the end you extract the beam. And this makes uh, machines like that. This is the med machine, which is the a sister of our CNAO machine because the daughter are uh, the daughters of a project we launched in uh, 30 years ago at CERN called Thank you. Well, thank you for, for this explanation. So we won't have a uh, um, uh, small sized uh, accelerator for generating those protons or we can ions. Do, we can do in, in superconductivity. Maybe we have time to come back to this. Maybe we'll have time, yes. But I'd like to ask a question to, to Esther. Uh, we've heard that uh, protons and carbon ions have very interesting properties to be more precise in terms of therapy. 
Are there other ions that uh, could be used also for, uh, for radiotherapy? Well, some of the hardened centers, but I think Hugo knows it even more about this than I do. Um, oxygen is, for instance, used and um, also very successfully used. Uh, the carbon ions are more generally available uh, worldwide. Um, but I think oxygen also has very interesting properties for the future. So our, let's say, um, sister institution in Heidelberg, they use uh, uh, oxygen or are going to use oxygen also. And using those um, heavier particles, we are able to treat also radio tumors, as already uh, Ugo alluded uh, to, and also recurrent diseases. So just imagine that a patient comes back after having had already irradiation, those tumors can be more radio resistant, so more resistant to again a course of radiotherapy because they acquire certain resistance mechanisms in cells that still remain. And in those inst instances, it's really worthwhile to consider using other modalities, not photons, not protons, but then move to these very special modalities like um, carbon ions or also oxygen. Well, thank you. So we understand that this uh, technology, which has been thought about and developed since 70 years, has still uh, potential for development, potential in terms of new ions that could be produced, but also potential to be made more available because of technological development. Very interesting. I, I suggest we move to another uh, interesting technology that is being developed in particular here at CERN, and this is what we call flash radiotherapy. And okay. Manjit, maybe you want to explain to us what flash radiotherapy okay. is about. So just to say that what we've been doing with radiation therapy, one of the key treatments for cancer treatment for over 50, 60% of the patients. And we've spent a lot of time and energy trying to make it precise as possible to minimize the damage to healthy tissues. And recently, I said, there's a paradigm coming along which is called flash therapy. Flash, because it's very fast, it's high energy. But what is really interesting is that if you do a high amount of energy dose in a very short time, somehow, under those conditions, healthy tissues are selectively protected. So the tumor damage remains the same, but the healthy tissues are protected, which is what we have been trying to do with all the technologies, all our treatment planning, all our imaging. So of course, you can imagine, there's a lot of interest in looking at this. I mean, this is a recent thing. 2014 was a paper that was published from the Mercury Institute in Paris. And since then, there's a lot of interest. So, and what is also interesting about this is, it's independent of the particles, whether it's photons, whether it's x-rays, whether it's protons, carbon, they, you can have flash with all particles. It seems to work with all tissues and, and all animals that we looked at so far. So, and, and, and the beauty of it is that you're talking about large energy in very, very short time, less than 500 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, depends who you are asking, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of work to be done, and it could be 10 gray, it could be 40 gray, so there's a lot of work done to be there. But the advantage of that is that short periods, more patients, mm -hmm. so high throughput, large energies, fewer fractions, so patients can be treated in shorter time, so, and since it can be any particles, and since we are sitting around CERN here, one of the black particles that's gained a lot of interest is electrons, but high energy electrons. Because up to until now, we have 25 uh, millivolts, <laughs> MeV electrons, but sort of small energy. But 25 millivolt electrons can only reach just below the surface. Mm -hmm. So we were not able to do high, very high energy electrons because the, technology that was needed has been recently developed through the click technology so that you can make compact short, small machines so they can fit into a clinical setting. You can accelerate electrons to up to 200 MeV, so that's large for uh, pa patients speaking, and you can go further into the body. And the electrons have the beauty compared to photons uh, that they are charged, so they can be focused, they can be scanned, you can penetrate further in. So of course you can do it with protons, carbons, and so on, but electrons, as we heard, are a 2,000th size of a proton, so the machines would be a little bit simpler, shall we say, okay? So and, uh, we, there's a lot of research to be done before it becomes a clinical reality, but the beauty of something like that would be is 
that you selectively protect healthy tissue. You can put large amounts of energy, and if it's very short times, you don't worry about patient movement, organ motion, all of these things. So there's a dreams to be coming true. Okay, well, Esther, I guess this is quite uh, appealing. Uh, it seems to have all the characteristics that we expect from a, a, a better radiotherapy. So if the effect is, is confirmed in humans, which I understand is not the case yet, what would it change or what would it mean for, for, for your uh, practice? Well, indeed, it has not been confirmed yet, so we're very much looking forward also to the very first studies which will start soon on this uh, very promising treatment modality. I think one aspect that we still have to look into also is that we have to make sure that the tumor that we are going to treat is at the right position at the right moment in time. So we have to really be careful with the imaging modality. But if this is all there and we have compact machines able to do this, so the, that the number of sites that we can treat uh, in, in terms of departments delivering flesh is increasing. And at the same time, the treatment fraction of the sessions that we have to deliver the treatment in is decreasing. As Manjit already said, we are able to treat hopefully more patients and reduce their morbidity um, considerably also for the future. And so this is really something that's very worthwhile to look into and uh, hopefully this will be a dream to come true. Well, thank yeah, you. I'd add here a yes, point, please. Antoine, just to, to remind uh, that uh, there is a project on this at CERN, uh, which mm -hmm. is CERN, CHUV, and a company whose name is Teric of the Alzheimer Group, who is building such an accelerator, has funds for it, and this will be something becoming real soon. So it's not only an idea, but something that will become real soon. So we don't have to wait for the next no. large accelerator no. at CERN to make progress in this no. domain. This is well, in fact, it's, no, it's, it's interesting because it is the consequence of an accelerator which has been studied at CERN for 30 years. Myself, I've contributed 30 years ago, which is called CLIC, which had to do collision of collisions of electrons at positive and very high energy. And now it comes out that the technique developed can be used. You see, if may I add another small point, is that it's difficult to explain to people why uh, what we do at CERN is useful. Because it's not what we learn that is useful. You see, biology, you speak with the biologists, they say, oh, yeah, I study molecular biology. Of course, I study cells. This is good for treating cancer. Everybody understands. But what we do here is not the knowledge that we acquire by colliding our particles that we apply, are the instruments which we have developed to, to answer the difficult questions that uh, were put to us by nature that uh, give us the instruments to move forward, for instance, in treating cancer. Thank you very much. Uh, may I make a point? Uh, precisely what Frabugo is saying. So the very first patient we talked about, protons, hadrons, from 1954, the first clinical facility was 1990. So until then, everything was done in high energy physics laboratories. And but it took a long time. But this idea of using high energy electrons or protons and flash and so on. So we are actually building the machine, as Ugo said, in a collaboration, because there isn't a clinical facility of high energy electrons at the moment, okay? But there will be soon. But in parallel, you have to have the beams to be able to do all the biology, instrumentation, imaging, and all of that to make it into a radiobiology clinical reality. So these things are now happening in parallel, and we happen to have a clear facility at CERN where it's the only one at the moment where you can go up to 200 MeV electrons. So this is happening parallel. Hopefully, we don't have to wait 50 years for realization. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a few minutes now for, for you, the audience, to ask questions to our experts in this domain. So feel free to, to raise your hand. And there are some microphones uh, moving around. And wait until you get your microphone to ask the question. Who would like to ask a question on those accelerators There's one over there. Yes, up there. Uh, th thanks a lot. So you mentioned that uh, in this flash uh, technique, uh, it's somehow working. So was it like an accidental discovery, or is it the theory behind which was put to prove this? So what is the story behind this flash? 
Okay, so we've seen glimpses in the past, but we didn't really have the technology and the methodology to be able to look at that. And you could say it's an accident, maybe not, because they were radiating mice in the Curie Institute, and they suddenly realized that when they did a large dose in very short time, using flush with the conventional, the flush protected the healthy tissues, and the conventional damaged the, the tissues. And that sort of opened the field to see, is it really true? So look at different animals, look at different tissues, look at different conditions, and everything we've looked at so far, it seems to be true. But we don't know the mechanism. There's a, well, there are a lot of theories, of course. And you know, there was oxygen depletion, there was amino responses, but we actually have to understand the mechanism. Then we have to understand how are we going to leverage this situation. And then, of course, one of the biggest things is it's very, very fast. So actually, we don't have technologies for doing the dosimetry mm. and how to conform the tumor you know, in terms of spreading, because it's high energy electrons, et cetera. And if I may say that our collaboration, which is Mary Catherine Bozanin, who was one of the co-authors of the very first paper in the Curie, is here in Geneva. We are working together, and we are going to publish now to say it's not just the huge dose, but actually it's the instantaneous dose which seems to be the most protective issue. So we've been looking at a number of parameters and this should come out soon, so we are working on it. Well, that's exciting. So a lot of research needed. We understand that there is an effect, but we need to understand it before we can actually move to, to, to treat patients with this kind of uh, approaches. Another question? Yes, there's another question over there. Uh, The lady in, in purple, or, no, 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 lady in purple <laughs> was first. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about radioisotopes. Uh, from what I understand, they could be more easy to use in um, medical application than flash uh, technology. And I wanted to know what's your take on that? Radioisotopes. I didn't get right. That. So, uh, ra radioisotopes is, is another topic that we're going to be dealing with in the next session because here we're really talking about particles that have been uh, given a lot of energy by accelerators and not really radioisotopes uh, as such. Yeah. So, uh, if you don't mind waiting for the next session, I think you'll get probably some of the answers. And if, you don't, if not, we uh, will try to answer your question. And the last question, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for the flash. Uh, you need a huge facility similar to the carbon, or uh, how big is the facility that you need for the flash treatment? Uh, well, like uh, the cyclotron or something Depends smaller. which particles. As I said, flash works for all particles. So you could use it for carbon, proton, electrons, photons, and so on. So we are very attracted here with electrons because of the fact that electrons are 2,000 sm smaller than protons, right? So the machine which should be more compact, because the electrons, and all the technologies, as uh, Professor Maldi has mentioned, with the click technology has managed to come up with technology which makes it more compact anyway, and we can put it in a clinical setting. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it, protons and carbon. But the machine footprint will be depending on which particles you use. But, but we like electrons. <laughs> <laughs> so for electrons, the size of the machine, uh, what, uh, what would it be? It would will it be... be three meters or something. Three, uh, yeah, it will be slight, slightly larger than one room. Oh, okay. but, it's the, but the thing is, there is no clinical facility at the moment. The first one is, going to be, be, is being built right now in Lausanne, in Schuf. And then there's also in Italy and Southern California and one in France. So we will know, but they will be... Slightly larger than the conventional NX, but certainly smaller than protons and carbon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I think we need to move on. So I really want to thank you, Manjit, uh, Esther, and Hugo. You deserve a big round of applause. And we're going to be moving to the second session, looking inside the human body. And we're going to be talking about detectors and radioisotopes. And our experts for this session are Magdalena. Magdalena, you're professor of instrumentation 
in medical imaging and you are head of the nuclear imaging research group at the University of Lübeck. John, you are the head of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging at the Lausanne University Hospital and University of Lausanne. And Michael, you are a senior scientist here at CERN and you are the spokesperson of the Medipix collaborations. Michael, we're going to first be talking about the technology that is really new. Uh, we are all used to see CT scanners in black, white, and shades of gray. And what you are working on is to put color into those scanners. And we'd like to understand a bit better what is this technology that is called hybrid pixel sensors. Okay, the first thing to say is that a hybrid pixel sensor is a combination of a, a readout chip, which is segmented into channels, so typically a few hundred by a few hundred channels, connected to a sensor, which is equally segmented. Particles arrive in the sensor, deposit charge, and in the electronics, we detect the particles one by one. Now, for the Large Hadron Collider, when we were developing that, we had to make tracking systems, which worked really in the middle of the detector, and we're able to take kind of photos of the passing particles every 25 nanoseconds. So it's the very close combination of the electronics and the sensor, which made it possible to do that. So the electronics made us able to detect each particle one by one. And when a particle wasn't there, the pixels were quiet. So these are multi-channel systems. Now, x-rays, which are used in medicine, um, come in different energies. So when you switch on your x-ray tube, uh, a whole spectrum of energies passes through the body. A typical conventional X-ray detector will take all that energy and integrate it on a single pixel mm -hmm. and make a kind of, you can think of it as a black and white image. Now, because for high energy physics, we were detecting the particles one by one, we can actually measure the energy of the different photons as they come through the body. And you can think of those energies as kind of color. So here are three images of a lighter. On the left is a low energy image, in the middle a medium energy image, and the blue one is a, a higher energy image. And what you can see is that different energies of photons bring different information with them. So on the left side, you can see that the lighter fuel has some contrast, and that's because the low energy photons are preferably absorbed there. Whereas in the right hand image, you can see that the lighter fuel is gone, but you can see through the thicker parts of the, um, of the lighter. So there's different information according to different energies. And then we combine those three informations to make the right-hand image, which has got better contrast for the same dose given to the patient. So that's one of the key aspects of this uh, spectroscopic or color X-ray imaging. Excellent. And so this device was first developed for the LHC? Yeah, so we, we devel developed different generations of devices. Mm -hmm. uh, the first ones for the LHC were made such that they were convenient for LHC. So they basically took the images, stored the images for a few hundreds of uh, micro, or a few, few microseconds and a set select image was sent out. In the Medipix collaborations, which are 30, more than 30 members now, we made various generations of chips where instead of doing this kind of photographing and delaying thing, we actually send, we count the photons one by one and send that information off chip. And what you can see here is, in fact, the Timepix 3 chip. So the top part there is the sensor, and the bottom part with the little wire bonds is where the uh, readout chip is. So, John, I understand that you have one of these devices in, in Lausanne. Uh, can, you, can you tell us from uh, a practicing physician wh what this means and what this changes? Well, um, the information you get uh, from the microphone. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, the information. We may bring you a microphone, maybe. Screen. Sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you. So I was telling uh, the information we get uh, in radiology from uh, such uh, spectral imaging uh, is um, information from the morphology. Uh, and this is helpful to characterize disease. Here you can see and uh, recognize uh, the bones of the hand. And some diseases are affecting 
and putting crystals, uh, it's called GUT, and this disease can be better characterized with such a color CT, if you want. It's been used exceptionally in humans. Uh, it's not used yet clinically, and there are a few machines worldwide. Uh, we will use it soon at CHUV in Lausanne, but um, it's very forefront of the technology we can try to bring to patients, and it's going to be very useful. Uh, it's actually developed um, by a company in New Zealand, and so it's just to mention the worldwide extension of research at the forefront. Thank you, but Michael, uh, uh, so this collaboration is worldwide. Can you explain how it works with you know, New Zealand and Switzerland and yeah, so the rest the of the world? Basically, when we were developing the chip which was used to make these images, um, it's called the Medipix 3 chip, 2010 more or less. We were promoting this to various large vendors of uh, X-ray systems and they weren't interested because they, can, they thought it was too early to do this work. That being said, so we found this company in New Zealand, or the, in fact a colleague in New Zealand who was interested in starting a company, and they took it on and, and made these images. In parallel with that, we started workshops, which we host at CERN every second year, mm -hmm and to which we invite the big uh, vendors of equipment, the research hospitals, and then the people like ourselves, the technical people developing such systems. And so over the last 10 years or so, we've basically built the groundwork, which has prepared uh, the environment for, for photon counting. And in fact, it's true that this machine isn't used on patients yet, but Siemens have the world's first photon counting device uh, I think they've sold maybe many, many tens of those devices, which are now used in hospitals. Thank you. And it's true that when you look at those images, you see a degree of detail that is this uh, quite unheard of, especially when you look at other CT scanners. So that probably will be extremely useful in certain domains where you need this level of precision. Um, yes, it is uh, exactly true. And uh, we're expecting to be able to better characterize uh, some disease where crystals are building into articulation. So we're uh, hopefully um, getting some results very soon for patients. Excellent. And Michael, do you think that this kind of technology can be put to other uses that are relevant to, to medicine? In fact, there is an example today on the, if you go to the CERN home page today, you'll find an example from our colleagues in uh, Heidelberg. So they were working with one of our spin-off companies. So the collaboration has many uh, components and some of the um, academic members of the collaboration of spin-off companies, one's called Advacam, and they built a camera for hadron therapy patients. So when a carbon ion comes through the body, as it goes, it fragments, and those fragmented particles come out of the patient in any case. And what these people have built is a camera which images those fragments and then can determine what's really happening inside the skull. Uh, and in particular, that's important during the treatment, so from day to day to make sure that the inside of the skull doesn't evolve too much. And if it were to evolve too much, then perhaps you would do, you'd like to intervene and do something, uh, something else. So you really combine detectors that really help you understand better how to use those accelerators. Yeah, that's an example. Yeah. So those two are, are yeah. working together. <coughs> that, that's really exciting. Thank you. So we have here uh, um, upcoming technology that is likely to, to, to make a difference both in terms of diagnosis but also in terms of the precision of treatments. Yep. Let's maybe move to another technology that uh, was alluded to uh, before, the positron emission tomography or PET uh, imaging. Um, John, um, you're a specialist in this domain. Can you explain the basic principles of physics that actually enable to produce this kind of images? Maybe a few words on those images and then the physics that is behind it. Okay, yeah. Um, what you can see here is a brain uh, consumption of um, glucose. You know that glucose is essential for our brain to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually showing how each part of the brain is using the glucose. Um, this technology is um, unique because it's very sensitive. It's uh, only using a few uh, picomol, which is like one uh, million of one million uh, of a mole. So it's, it's very uh, little uh, as atom. And uh, using this, you can be very sensitive and observe tissue with that 
disturbing uh, the tissue itself. So um, basically, uh, this sugar is labeled and is attached to a radionuclide that you can see here, uh, which is in this case, for instance, F18. Uh, and this F18 is going to uh, decay and produce um, a new particle, uh, which is called the positron. We have seen the positron is the antimatter of the electron. It's a positively charged uh, electron, if you wish. And when in the material you have electrons meeting anti-electrons, so it's matter and antimatter, and it produces what you know very well, because I know you worked on that, an annihilation. So both particles are disappearing, but according to Einstein's law, um, the energy of these two particles cannot disappear, and it's being basically emitted in two gamma rays um, of uh, opposite direction, so we can get the same momentum, that is zero, and placing detectors around the patients and looking at simultaneous acquisition of these two gamma rays interacting with the crystals, as you have seen here, uh, then you can basically get back to the patient and trace a line of interaction where the positron, where the emission would have been uh, taking place. And doing this for millions of disintegration per second, so it's really what our machines are measuring, millions of interactions, you can basically get a good overview of the distribution within the body of the material you're looking at, for instance, this sugar. And using this, we, it's a way we detect disease. And you measure the function of the organ, not the shape of the organ. Exactly. Really we measure pathology. We measure the disease by a different function uh, using these very sensitive um, detectors that are really looking like uh, the physics and the energy physics detectors. But I think we will get into that. Especially with you, Magdalena, because you work on instrumentation for imaging <laughs> devices and in particular for, for PET imaging. Can you tell us a bit more about the type of de de detectors that are used? Well, actually the detectors that we use are not that different from the detectors used in particle physics. Here you see the typical scintillation crystal, which is a material which when the photons, high energy photons interact, produces light. And we use this light, we measure the light to infer if we have a photon or not. And this technology is the same. But of course, here you see a large crystal. This, I think, is the crystal uh, clear collaboration, which was very productive also uh, to transfer a lot of technology to the field of, of medical imaging. And, but now we have very small crystals. Everything is reduced, and we can, uh, but the principle remains the same. Okay. And, yeah. So is it like a solved problem, crystals, or are there still developments? Oh, are no. there still challenges that you need to, to, to solve? To I think we have experts here in the audience, and I think it's a, a something which is evolving every day, because we, when you have something, you want more. So we have now very fast detectors. We have uh, high sensitivity detectors, but we want faster detectors, because uh, the speed or the detection um, is very important in PET, because you, uh, you have to match. You have to match one photon with another photon, because you have millions, as was said, and we no need to know the two belong together. So, and this means you need very fast detectors. And also now we go one step beyond with time of flight PET, which means we n not only make a pair, but we also try to define the difference in the arrival time. And you have to think, photons, they are extremely fast. They need less than two seconds to reach the moon. So now we are talking about this distance of a scanner, and we are trying to measure the difference in the arrival time. So, so really time of flight is measuring the time that the photons take to reach the detector, well, knowing that they take like, like a nanosecond or something like that? Because we are talking picosecond. about commercial scanners with a resolution of 200 okay. picoseconds, which is like dividing the number two by 10,000 millions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need to That's think. quite impressive. <laughs> John, you, you mentioned that to do a PET scan, uh, you need to have uh, a radio pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical uh, that is uh, tagged or labeled with a, a radioactive uh, element. 
uh, that is injected into the patient and then uh, can, be, can be imaged. How are these radioisotopes produced? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. They are produced in radio pharmacies. Uh, it's a pharmacy dedicated to labeling uh, these um, molecules. And um, we can use very much the same radionuclides, the same disintegrating uh, atoms, if you wish, but targeting to a different uh, pharmaceutical, a different drug that is radio labeled. Uh, we can get several functions. We can measure many things for cancer, uh, we can measure uh, a neurodegenerative disease, we can measure cardiovascular disease, and so uh, taking a different radio re pharmaceutical is like having a new technique. Every time you change your radio pharmaceutical, you discover new things and you look at the body from a different angle. Okay, can you use some of the accelerators here to produce those radio isotopes, or do you, do you, you don't need them? Uh, no, we really are dependent. Uh, they are not uh, made in CERN, the one we're um, actually using in the clinics. They are made by dedicated uh, cyclotrons, um, and people have to work at night uh, so that it can be delivered in the morning to hospital, and it's always a race against the time. Mm -hmm. Most of the radiopharmaceutical we're using have half time of two hours or even less. We are still using one for the heart that is having a 76 second half-life. So you have to right. get the images while you're injecting the patient. Okay, that's another challenge. My understanding is that some of those radioisotopes can also be used to uh, treat diseases. Can you, can you tell us about this new field of, I think, Theranostics? Yeah, well, this is connected, I think, with the question which exactly. was posed before, that we can use radioisotopes for imaging or for therapy, or we can have therapy and uh, besides imaging as well, because these radioisotopes, I think there was a movie with this submarine which uh, was miniaturized and put in the blood, and mm -hmm. then we do the same with the radioisotopes. We send the submarine, it go goes to the tumor, and the radiation is killing the, the cells. But in addition, if we have, in sometimes, uh, further radiation which goes out, and we can use PET or other detectors so we know <coughs> more about the, radi the radiotherapy treatment, how it's going on. And is this something that is happening already now, John? It, it's happening since a, a long time. Uh, the first um, treatment for thyroid disease, as you may know, uh, was performed using iodine-131 from uh, reactors, and it's been uh, actually 80 years ago, so a long time ago. And we're doing more and more of these uh, therapies. Uh, now we have... Um, full um, uh, arsenal, if you wish, of such um, radio labeling uh, molecules for treating cancer. And uh, we're better in some cancer than everything that is existing. That's why it's being used for, for instance, uh, multi-metastatic hormone-resistant cancer of the prostate. It's one of the best therapy you can have. And very few side effects for the patients. We want to extend that to other disease and more and more patients that could benefit from these therapies. So you take one radioisotope for making the image and then you substitute the radioisotope with another one that is much more powerful for the treatment? Is that the idea of what we call theranostics, so the mix of therapeutics and diagnostics? Exactly. The, the human body doesn't make any difference from uh, the chemical that we're using. So we can use uh, radio nuclides that are actually making images, emitting gamma rays, but we can also use uh, more potent rays that are very close interaction, like um, beta minus electrons, or we can use also alpha rays uh, that are alpha uh, rays. And uh, it's, it's very powerful and actually treats only the region where it attached and only the cancerous cells and doesn't touch um, the um, healthy cells. So it's very targeted therapies. I, I would add that mm -hmm. you also have some few radioisotopes which can do both. I mean, mainly therapy is the main goal, but a, one of a, another decay mode or they can also produce uh, in a low probability, but you have also radiation which escapes the patient and you can detect it with PET or with gamma uh, detectors and the like. 
uh, and maybe to answer one of the questions that was asked in the previous session, uh, it's always good to actually combine techniques. So the external radiation therapy can also be combined with the internal radiation therapy, what we're doing, and also with regular drugs like immunotherapy. So we're always stronger together. All right. And that's a perfect uh, lead to the next discussion I'd like to have with you, which is the importance of having physicists working in particle physics with physicians working in hospitals. And that has been one of the reasons why the PET imaging has been developed. And I think we can look at, uh, at old images. This is an image from 1977 when uh, the first images were produced uh, here at CERN. And relatively soon after, the team that had developed those tools moved to the University Hospital of Geneva uh, and had the first device. You, know, you see, if you look at the device on the left, it still looks like an experimental device, but it was good enough for uh, actually imaging patients and uh, uh, helped the development of the positron emission tomography um, as I mentioned, I was involved as a medical student, and I actually am, I'm the only one who ha doesn't have a, a white coat uh, on the picture on the right, to, uh, on the right corner, just you know, getting uh, uh, not photobombing, but getting on the picture, which was a historical picture of, of building this device and, and trying it in the hospital. And I think this, this, you know, you said we're stronger when we work together. I think this is a very important, uh, important message. And maybe, maybe uh, uh, so we here we talk about the collaboration between hospitals and the, uh, researchers uh, and developers of technologies here at CERN. Maybe, Michael, you want to comment also on the collaboration between uh, CERN and the industry? Yeah, so basically we at CERN have a core competence, which is the design of these chips. But we have little knowledge of how to apply those in other fields. And the... The kind of chips we made were interesting for other people, so we gathered people together, coming from different academic institutes. And uh, when we made a chip which was valuable and useful, first of all, we did our scientific research with that, but then we, we uh, licensed that chip to companies such as Mars Bioimaging. And it's those companies who actually take it from there to the clinic. There are some cases where there are direct uh, um, links between us and doctors, but for the most of the part, it's through collaboration. So it's through other members of the collaboration who are more competent to make a, the correct interface to our clinical colleagues, in fact. Right. And, and John, maybe you want to tell us a bit of, of a story that led to the development of uh, PET CT, which is combining a PET scanner with a CT scanner, because I think those discussions actually took place around this device that we see here, and is also a very interesting uh, uh, concept of merging two different kinds of imaging, one that shows the shape of the organ, one that shows the function of the organ, and that can lead to very uh, precise and informative uh, images. Um, exactly. I think it, this was a, a brilliant idea that um, Dave Townsend, as a physicist, had to, to combine uh, these two modalities and actually to make the first scanner. Uh, the first scanner um, hit uh, the clinical arena around 2000 and um, now, 24 uh, years later, there are above 6,000 of these PET CT scanners worldwide. And um, I have here to admit that it was a fundamental step uh, for nuclear medicine. I don't know where we would be in nuclear medicine without this instrument but it's actually the most exquisite way to find very small tumor and uh, to characterize the disease better. Uh, you may want to know where the disease is exactly uh, located. Uh, localized disease is still uh, cured by surgery. You remove everything and the patient is cured. But for that, using such a technique where you can localize what we call the, the functional image, what you have on the right, it's, uh, you can see the tumor in the lung uh, taking up that uh, sugar, and it's uh, very well above what would be expected. And we know this is a lung tumor, so it can be removed, and uh, the exact delineation of every disease in the body can be made with PET-CT. 
And this is a fundamental tool that, that uh, really changes the way we practice medicine. Patients, they know after the PET scan, they know exactly where the disease is and they will get the best ter therapy based on the extension of the disease. So I cannot emphasize as much as um, it changed really what we can do for patients using this technique. And it's a technique that is more and more used worldwide and uh, is mandatory now for many diseases. Uh, unfortunately, it's not available in every country. Uh, there are countries where delivering um, psychotron is, is difficult or delivering this sugar. So we're also trying to make this nuclear medicine accessible to most people worldwide. We are lucky here in Europe or in North America, but there are less luckier, especially in low and middle income countries. And we're also working, um, maybe developing, thanks to physicists, better and cheaper machines that can be sent everywhere. Thank you very much. So before we, we turn to the audience for, for questions, maybe last question for you, Magdalena. Uh, what do you see as the next big challenges for nuclear imaging? Well, it's uh, like the Olympic Games, you know, faster, bigger, and everything. So we have now this total body PET, these very large scanners, where you have uh, the patient all at once. You don't have to move it, which means also that you reduce the dose that you, you inject, which is good for low dose, so reduce exposure for children especially. Also the throughput, you can have m m more patients per day because they are faster. But uh, from the bigger also to the smaller, now we are able to have very, very small scanners for in my team, for example, for zebra fish, which is an animal model, but also dedicated scanners for prostate, for brain, for different organs, so that you don't need a big thing. You, you can have something more affordable, and maybe in the future we can do a screening with PET with low-dose dedicated systems and many other fancy things, theranostics, for example, also apply to proton therapy. Proton therapy means the patients become radioactive for a very short time, and we can also detect this radiation and try to find out if our protons or carbon ions or whatever are being um, di directed to the right place. So there are many, plenty, plenty so of things. More and work. Yeah. More work, that's good. So now your turn in the audience if you have questions about, the, in particular, those two technologies that we've discussed, color CT with this uh, uh, new high-resolution imaging and then PET imaging. Yes. Thank you. So um, I was wondering, for even with TOF PET, I think the spatial resolution is limited by the mean free path of the positron. Um, I was wondering, is there a way to improve this? Or is that just a hard fundamental limit that you can't uh, get over? Well, maybe you can re reformulate the question because I'm not sure everybody understands what uh, 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 a tough bet. So it's time of flight. Positron emission tomography, is that, that? Yeah, I think the issue is that we have seen in one of these slides that the positron travels a couple of millimeters even before it annihilates with an electron. Mm -hmm. While well, the distance depends, in, it's in a probabilistic pro process. And in fact, time of flight, this is true, we detect only the photons, but we don't know where the positron was emitted. However, we can use a lot of uh, models, physical models, and now we come to the theory, to the algorithms that we are also putting into this, uh, what we call image reconstruction process. So time of flight plus physical models, our knowledge of what is going on, maybe CT information and AI, which comes later, all these things together help us to reduce this intrinsic limit. Of course, a little bit remains, but we are able to reduce a lot the impact of positron range. Maybe I could add something. So Please. when you do spectroscopic X-ray imaging, you actually image the different materials inside the body. Now, spectroscopic X-ray imaging will never be as sensitive as PET is, but it's much more precise in terms of uh, spatial resolution. So one could imagine in some future that we develop tracers which have some uh, particles which are particularly absorbent in particular en uh, frequencies or energies of photons, whereby you could make some kind of um, uh, functional image 
in the PET scanner itself, so without having to have recourse to the, uh, to the PET modality. But this is really the, 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 the music of the future, okay. and, and the sensitivity will be much less, but it's something to, to we have in the back of our minds. All right. John, you want to add something? Uh, maybe I can add something about uh, uh, this resolution. It's, uh, the intrinsic resolution is, may not be a problem, uh, because a surgeon will take a margin of security, and um, if we don't know exactly uh, where it is emitted within a few millimeter, which is already very good, otherwise uh, you have to use a robot to take uh, things under a position of one millimeter, um, it will be still helpful, uh, basically, to see the most smallest disease. So what we are really interested in is looking into sensitive, and the most sensitive way is to see the smallest amount of um, tumors, and then you take a margin, and then it's still helpful. So this is not a serious limitation, but uh, we use um, what we can get from the sensitivity. So any advance in sensitivity, and time of flight is helping us very much, we can get uh, the, the smallest amount of tumor. So sensitivity is more important that, uh, than you precision? Need both, but, you uh, need both, but of course, yes. Okay, thank you, very interesting. Uh, another question? There's one here. Thank you. I have a question oh, about um, the spectral imaging that we were talking about at the beginning. I'm here. Uh, yes. Um, is there a chance that in the future um, this technology could uh, allow to, um, to, 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 to do some functional imaging and somehow replace um, nuclear medicine in any way? Is there a chance that uh, there could be like, um, yeah, function that could be deduced from, from those, what those sensors produce. Yeah, so I, I think in terms of absolute sensitivity, we will never get there. But I think in terms of you know, where you just have to see uh, inside a body, uh, you know there's probably a tumor there. You don't have access to the, uh, the radio pharmaceuticals you need at that time. There may be moments in the future where there's a, some kind of tracer in the fridge the doctor can just inject into the patient and then make some kind of rough functional image of the body. So that's not going to replace PET, but it's certainly maybe going to make PET not required in all, in all cases. Thank you. I think there was a question here. If you can, can you raise your hand? Yes, hello to everyone. I'm Martin Koski from Medilan, son of Dr. Zlatko Tinkovsky, probably many of you already know. I have been delighted by this um, presentation and I used to work with uh, François Terrier, you probably know at HUG. So I have one basic question. Uh, seeing the resolution, the sensitivity of all your devices, which is increasing, a basic question for all the audience, What's the size of the actual chip you're trying, you're promoting, you're using? This is quite a basic question, but it may show and let everybody know the, the level of improving we have to do. Thanks. Okay, so the, the, if you look at the scanner we saw the photos of earlier, it's a scanner which turns around the wrist, okay? That scanner is composed of, I think, 10 chips. Each chip is about kind of that size. So it's something which is kind of the size. For a, a full body CT scanner, you need something a bit bigger. Uh, so you have to combine chips. We're at the present time working on a new generation of readout chips called Medipix 4, because we don't have much imagination <laughs> in namings, uh, whereby in the past, we always had to have one side of the chip for wire bonding. You saw the wire bonds earlier for reading out the chip. We're now aiming to hide those, wire, those uh, connections underneath the radio electronics using a technology called through silicon via. So we just have a new generation of chips arrived. They're working. And we're now working with the uh, suppliers of through silicon vias in order to enable us to tile those chips side by side to cover a larger area. Cost is still an issue, of course. But of course, cost in, in new technologies is always very high in the beginning. And then it depends on volume whether this decreases with time. Well, thank you. I think there's much more to be discussed, but the time flies and we need to, to move to the next session. I want you to give a big applause to our experts. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, Michael.
John, you will stay with us for the, the last uh, session, uh, which is about the digital health revolution. And for this session, we're welcoming Steve McFeely. Steve McFeely is Director of Data and Analytics at the World Health Organization, yet another very important organization we are very proud to have here in Geneva and collaborate with as much as we can. Uh, we have John Pryor that we've already uh, met, as well as, and you're back, and that shows that the digital revolution is in, in working well, uh, back on Zoom with, uh, with Esther. So uh, the, the idea here is to uh, maybe not you know, go over everything about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, but just to remind ourselves that we've been in this uh, digital revolution for, for quite a while now. And even though artificial intelligence has uh, become a common word for, for many, especially since uh, the advent now a little bit more than a year ago of uh, generative AI. Uh, it's been around for, for decades and, and so uh, artificial intelligence was, was thought about and, and developed even back in the, in the 1950s and uh, went into a succession of successes and winters, uh, times where uh, the results were quite disappointing but tools have continued to be developed, uh, fueled by the fact that we have more and more digital data available, and that's also something that the CERN contributed with the de development of the World Wide Web, as you know, which was initially developed here at CERN, making data shareable and, and available, and including for training in artificial intelligence, and also the development of uh, the, the computing power that, uh, that has grown uh, exponentially. So we are now uh, uh, talking a lot about generative AI, but I, I'd like to remind uh, ourselves that uh, we've been using uh, digital tools and digital technologies for a long time, uh, in particular in the domain of particle physics, for simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, other mechanisms of, for designing devices, and these usually start with scientists working on hard science and then they move into the field of, uh, of medicine and that's what we've seen um, uh, more and more. So now we're going to be talking about different ways that those, uh, this uh, digital revolution and the, these digital tools can, can make a difference in the topics that we've, uh, that we've uh, uh, discussed uh, this, this evening. And I'll start with you, Esther, and ask you how your field uh, is uh, impacted by the rise of digital technologies and what you see are as the main advantages for the patients. So radiotherapy has already been a very digital form of treatment, I have to say. Uh, a surgeon opens the body of a patient and is really inside the patient of an organ a tumor. What we normally do is make this CT scan for treatment planning then RTTs or doctors contour the organ at um, risk uh, around the tumor that has to be treated. They contour the tumor itself, and the physicist then does the treatment planning. But this is all digital, so it's not calculating, you know, say on a on a mobile phone or on a calculator, but it's really using all the devices. But it's very time consuming, so a lot of things changed in recent years, so uh, the, we have automated structures that are delivered for the RTTs and for the doctors to check. And these structures represent the organ at risk, so it makes it uh, a, a shorter um, time frame of contouring everything. It used to be an hour or an hour and a half, now it's just something like five minutes. We still have to it's a lot of time for the contouring of the tumor because it has to be done very carefully. But then you can also pass everything on to the physicists and they do the treatment planning with preset um, treatment planning models or also there, deep learning is stepping in. So deep learning is producing treatment plans that can be first estimated guess 
that then physicists start working on, or even oh, physicists works on it. If you really have very tight constraints before you start doing the treatment plan, so this is really the radiotherapy. But we heard in Iran that it's not only radiotherapy that treats and cures cancer patients, but these patients are discussed in tumor boards, and it is tumor boards all the disciplines are available. So surgeons, medical oncologists, radio oncologists, um, the radiologists, the medicine physicians, pathologists, and all those data are available to make the best decision for the patient. And this is done on evidence-based and maybe also evidence-based, that has been tradition. And now we are moving to the digital world there as well. So a lot of um, vendors are offering tools to enable us to have a decision for the individual patient. And this is really changing the way that we are looking into patients nowadays. Apart from treatment planning and also making the best decision for a patient, it can be that we are better in prevention and also in the, um, let's say, screening capability. So this really changes the way that we treat patients and that we also make sure that we prevent them from developing cancer. Thank you. So if I summarize, those tools first help you to do faster and probably more precisely things that were usually done by hand or, or by interacting with the computer, but the computers now can do part of the, the planning in for, for, for the treatment. They, those tools can also help coordinate and merge information from multiple sources so that decisions can be made uh, in, in multidisciplinary tumor boards. And they also help to uh, target the best or choose the best treatment for a specific patient in what we could call precision medicine or precision oncology. Is that correct? That's totally correct. In imaging, I'm sure that those tools, whether uh, it's uh, computing or artificial intelligence, can play a significant role. Can you tell us how things are being used and where you see the field going in, in your domain of expertise? Um, it's actually uh, used um, every day, um, basically to help uh, to put the patient and uh, put the different regions. So it helps for doing the acquisition of the image and the good reconstruction of the different uh, part of the body. It can recognize the parts directly uh, from um, the CT that is being done, and then prepare and help to do faster uh, imaging and um, safer imaging too. It can also be used um, basically to measure and compute uh, tumor burden for the patient, like where the disease is located and how much disease is there in the images. And um, actually what uh, it can be used uh, or it will be used in the future, it's also to help to predict response to therapy based on the first imaging that are done once a ter therapy is initiated. So it's very much used. We can um, even envision to have digital twins of a patient where uh, we would know, given the patient characteristic, what therapy has the better chance to cure the patient and what side effect would the therapy bring to the patient. So it's very much used and uh, it's something where we're always will be needing um, physicists, we always will be needing physician, radiologist, nuclear medicine, uh, physician, because it's only a help and uh, it will never replace the physician. Uh, you probably all know that airplanes can fly alone, they have autopilot, they can take off and land, but you would be a bit more nervous if you know there were no pilot in the airplane. So it's a bit the same. Um, we are the pilots and we get the help of um, artificial intelligence to better do the diagnosis and better do and faster do our daily job. All right. But I guess some of those artificial intelligences can actually detect and see things that uh, humans can, cannot see. Exactly. Humans can get tired. Uh, they probably cannot look at uh, 
mammograms for screening for the whole day without breaks. And so in some centers, uh, we also are having lacks of uh, trained personnel and using machine can be acting as a second physician for doing these double reading in mammograms. So it's already being used and uh, it's very useful to see, especially in screening, as it was uh, discussed before, uh, things that would be escaping to uh, even a very good reader, but that would have uh, a failure rate that is still existing. We're uh, humans and we're not fail proof. All right, so, but in the end, it's still a human who's going to be signing the final report that is going to have an impact on, on, on the decision-making process. Exactly, and the, uh, the physicians that are using AI are going to replace the ones that are not. And today, it's still sufficient to look at an image with the, our own eyes. Tomorrow, it will not be sufficient, and we will need these AI tools to get the best care for the patient. So if I hear you, maybe we should not use AI as artificial intelligence, but AI as augmented intelligence, basically using our intelligence and augmenting it by our interaction with uh, clever machines. Is that the way you see things for the future of medicine? That's perfectly true. Again, the human and the machine are stronger together. All right. What we know is that those, those algorithms, those machines rely on data, Data is the new oil, you know, this is a kind of a... And you're the director of data analytics. And I'd like to hear from you what are the challenges for actually making this data usable, uh, useful for actually training those algorithms that we are going to be relying upon more and more. Steve. Yeah, so this is a complicated question from a WHO perspective because everything we've heard to date Implicitly, what we've been hearing about is massive volumes of data and very, very scientific data. What we deal with is a slightly different interface, when on one hand we have lots of data, on the other hand we, we deal with massive data paucity, and we also deal with the interface between scientific evidence and politics. So one of the challenges that we have is making sure that the data we produce is actually robust so that when machines are using it to, to train, that it is actually good quality evidence. And one of the biggest challenges is disaggregation. Even something as simple as sex disaggregation is still incredibly challenging. And we know from a lot of algorithms that there's, there's a lot of bias built in, uh, particularly around sex, but al also around um, ethnicity. Uh, and these are huge challenges um, that we face because despite everything we've heard, all the petabytes of information, there are many countries that still, they don't know what their basic population is. Um, they, they don't know where their populations are. And, and these are the challenges that we face, is building up robust data sets, because we know they're being imported and ingested into many, many models. Um, so robustness for us is, is really one of the challenges. It, it's really around the quality um, of the data that we're producing. And how can we improve quality? As you, as you mentioned, you're dealing with uh, worldwide, and which means with a very different heterogeneous uh, ways of dealing with data. How can we make sure that we increase the quality of, of, of this data as globally as possible? There's many ways. I mean, we've mentioned the digital revolution. I mean, that, that in itself is making massive volumes of data available. So one is to secure access to those data. Um, a lot of the data that's been produced now are proprietary, and it's really important that we fight to, to make sure that those data are accessible. Secondly, helping countries, helping governments in particular, to understand the importance of data and data infrastructure. Um, I, I think. A lot of times when you go to a government, if you said we need, we need oil, physical oil, they would implicitly understand that that means they have to extract oil, they have to store oil, they have to transport oil, they have to refine it. All of those things you have to do with data as well, but somehow it's not, it's not intuitive that they have to do all of those things. So th there is a disconnect between physical infrastructure and, and data infrastructure where one is they understand it requires investment. 
the, the data infrastructure, it's not obvious to them. They somehow think that data are free and that it doesn't require management, it doesn't require investment, and it doesn't, inquire, uh, it doesn't require capacity development. Because we need, as we heard, physicists, we need physicians, we need people who actually know what to do with the data once they get it. Do you think there's something to learn from CERN where you know massive amount of data is produced and exchanged and, uh, and, and, and uh, computed? They have developed tools for uh, federated, federating data, for distributing the workload of, of, of managing the data. Th those tools that are used uh, at the scientific level in excellence centers, do you believe that uh, this could be translated into uh, other settings? For sure, but in fact, not just the tools. What I would draw attention to is the protocols behind those tools. I mean, to exchange all of those data safely, there's a lot of governance procedures in place, a lot of data protocols, and, and that's really important. And, and again, this is one of the challenges we face is helping member states to understand the importance of data governance if they're going to share data, not, not just health data, but trade data, economic data, any type of personal data, it requires securities, it requires protocols, and I think CERN has developed them probably way ahead of anybody else, and it's now to transpose those lessons in, into other domains uh, to help people safely move data and exchange data. All right, so one key uh, lesson is if you want to improve the quality of the data, you have to work on the governance and the whole process, not just data itself. For sure. Now, maybe another question talking about data and data about patients. Obviously, these are sensitive uh, data. Uh, how do you see the, the issues about protecting privacy at an, in an era where we're talking about exchanging, merging, training uh, data. What are the issues as you see them for, for protecting the privacy of patient data? Uh, this is a, a very sensitive issue. Uh, it's true that your medical data are yours and it's ho hosted in the hospital. Uh, it's not possible uh, today to transfer uh, very easily millions of data from one hospital to the other and so on. If you're followed into different hospital, you can ask your file to be transferred and hopefully your images are following. But otherwise, uh, to make um, machine learning better, we need a lot of data and even a single hospital doesn't have enough data. So it's very difficult to transfer them, but it's needed to be able to build the models that would be actually useful for lots of patients. So CERN has developed what is called federated uh, learning, where actually the data can be, if you wish, processed locally. They never leave the hospital, so they are really staying in the hospital. But the machine that learns can learn independently into many different hospitals. And at the end, so the model can be built is uh, having thousands, even millions of cases where you can really learn from. So this is a very useful way uh, to make better data and to make more s meaningful data using lots of quantities and ensuring that all the data stays within the hospital safe and secure. So you keep the data safe and secure, you run algorithms locally, and what you've learned is what you exchange or make available to others, and that's federated learning. Yes. And that's something that's been developed at CERN. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Esther, do you want to chime in on those uh, data issues? I think they are uh, very relevant to your domain of expertise. If I may, yes. So the, the example just given about federated learning is also a way that we hope to get more evidence on the value of hadron therapy in the future. Um, we are building a big European database also, and this is not going to give away data by one uh, hospital to the next hospital. But what we really want to do is to have federated learning there as well. So the data stays there, but it's still extracted because it depends on the country that you talk to, whether it's easy to get the data uh, or it's really a burden to get the data out of hospitals or even of countries. 
And having said this, um, data protection issues are very important. It's very sensitive data that we have to be very careful with. And on the other hand, whenever we talk to patients and ask them to consent to share data, especially the cancer patients are more than willing to do so because they hope by giving away their data that it's also able, that they are also able to find a better treatment form for the patients of the future. So it's really about protecting the data and the privacy of the patients on the one hand, and on the other hand to make, make us in, or to enable us to use the data in the best and meaningful way and to have large databases that we can work for in the future. I think it's now time to turn back to you, to the audience, and see if you have questions. We've talked about uh, artificial intelligence. We talked about data quality and the importance of data governance. We've talked about new ways of sharing knowledge about data with the federated learning and needs to protect the data. We've also talked about the importance of making sure that the human uh, intelligence stays uh, in control of what is produced by artificial intelligence but I'm sure there are many more things we could discuss. So if you have questions to our experts, please raise your hand. There's a question over here. Thank you for this very fascinating lecture. Uh, I have a question on the evolution of uh, gender equality that you mentioned. The history of data analysis in medicine uh, over the last uh, century would suggest that uh, women were systematically underrepresented in uh, the data that we have collected and the development of pharmaceuticals and medical practices. How do you see this evolving with the capabilities and the data that we now have at our disposal? Are you seeing a systemic change really coming about? Can women really expect to get what they fully deserve. Thank you. Steve, I think you, I think that, you, you I think get the first. Uh... I think that's for me. Well, uh, let, let me answer it in two ways. So first, let me draw the distinction between sex and gender. So on sex, the, the delineation between male and female, the data there are improving, but there are many countries still where there's massive uh, positive data paucities. So in Europe, in the, in the developed world, if we can call it that, we've seen massive improvements in, in the sex disaggregated data across all data sets. And that's really important because it's not just the health data, but it's also the health related data. What we see though in many other parts of the world is that it, that's much more slow in coming. The other interesting development at the moment though is the evolution of the concept of gender. And what we see there is there's a really strong political backlash where many countries uh, just do not want the subject of gender discussed at all. And, and we see this both at the World Health Assembly but also at the United Nations. So any of the new genders that, that I'm sure have very significant medical implications, th there's a very strong backlash from many, many countries um, in the world where they just do not want this topic uh, measured or discussed. So we're seeing progress on the basic sex disaggregation, but not on the gender delineation. John? Maybe I can add that um, gender is, is really an issue. If we want to understand the disease very well, we need also to take into consideration this uh, gender dimension. Uh, because we know uh, that we're not all affected equally by uh, disease and um, especially um, some, for instance, cardiovascular disease or brain stress uh, from daily activity, it can be really different from uh, gender. And uh, we need to include this dimension if we really want to understand what we collect in our data and we, if we want to do better uh, care in the future and better prognosis and better understanding of the disease. Yeah. Esther, do you want to comment on this? Well. Um, then I, oh. I, I may as well, uh, sorry, did you? I, I saw you shake your hand. Okay, so, well, I, I, I would be a bit provocative and say that, you know, the artificial intelligence tools that we are currently seeing emerging are revealing the biases that are in the data, including 
those gender biases and including the fact that a lot of research in medicine is done mostly on young white males <laughs> and not in the representative of the, the humanity and the population. And this is a big issue. And this is an issue that I think has raised uh, to a, a higher level of awareness. And this is very much discussed in many circles dealing with this, this because obviously we cannot uh, build medicine that would only serve half of the humanity. And so my, my, my guess is that by revealing the biases that we've seen in, in, uh, in the various tools, in particular on, on, on those uh, AI and generative AI tools, we are going to be uh, trying to correct this. And it's not just correcting the output of the algorithm, it's making sure that we actually collect and understand the data at a, at a deeper level. I, I think it's also about retraining models. So at the moment, there's a discussion at the UN on a global digital compact. And part of that discussion is on governance of AI. And, and one of the big issues that's being discussed is both the, the training of models, but the retraining of models. So as new data uh, becomes available, it's really important that uh, models that, that were trained on data sets that are maybe 10 or 15 years old are forced to use the, the newer data, which, which all the time is improving, uh, to, to make sure that we can try and overcome these hidden biases. I mean, some of them are obvious. They're not the ones I'd actually worry about. It's, it's, it's the biases that aren't so obvious. Um, so yeah, it, it's a really, really important uh, discussion. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think our experts deserve a very warm round of applause. And I think this comes to the end of this uh, session. And uh, thank you so much for, for your participation. Thank you, Esther, for joining us uh, remotely. I think we've seen a lot of, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We've seen uh, all the developments that are happening at the interface of particle physics and medicine in the domain of accelerators and treatment of cancer, in the domain of advanced medical imaging, and in the domain of making use of all this digital data. And I think uh, this is food for thought, and hopefully you enjoyed this, uh, this uh, discussions. And now I'd like to invite on stage uh, uh, Manuela and, and Luciano, who have been actually organizing the whole event. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we hope you found uh, tonight's program enjoyable and also informative. Uh, for us, it has been a really great privilege to host such a remarkable panel of uh, specialists, uh, renowned scientists in particle physics and in medicine, um, uh, sharing with us uh, unique insights into the intersection and interplay between uh, these two fields. Now, before we uh, draw the, uh, the evening to a close, um, I wanted to uh, thank once more our distinguished guests um, for being uh, available uh, to, to participate in this event. Antoine for acting not only as a specialist, uh, but also as a moderator of this panel's discussions, and all those who have uh, contributed their expertise, uh, passion, and dedication for preparing uh, um, uh, this, this event, uh, and uh, of course uh, behind the organization of such an event uh, there is the work of many people, but uh, today I would like to um, um, uh, in particular thank Manuela Cirilli. <laughs> who has been a uh, uh, mastermind in uh, the conceptualization and also preparation of the, of the full event. So Manuela, I would like to uh, Thank you, Luciano. Pass the well, floor to you. Thanks. First of all, thank you for having me on board. Uh, thanks uh, to all the speakers, uh, to Antoine. It's been uh, great to see many familiar faces, uh, meeting new ones. Uh, um, and I don't like to be long. Everybody who knows me knows that uh, I, I go to the point uh, normally. So I go back to what Mike said at the beginning, uh, why we are here, uh, and the take-home messages uh, for you. It's really what we do at CERN is uh, knowledge for the sake of knowledge which is uh, a goal 
in itself, but it's also nice to see that it brings also very, very practical and tangible results in your lives. And I will conclude with two quotes that I take away myself from this evening. One is from John, that together we are stronger. And one, which actually you didn't hear, but is from Hugo, that physics is beautiful and useful. So thank you very much, everyone, and I thank hope you, you enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, and uh, finally, um, as we celebrate uh, the 70th anniversary of CERN, um, I would like to warmly invite you to the um, other very interesting events that we have lined up uh, for, uh, for the year. You see here in this uh, poster uh, the program of the upcoming uh, gatherings. Um, there are already four um, scheduled. And um, you can find more information about uh, these events and also when and how to, uh, to, to register by visiting uh, the, uh, the website sun70.cern. Uh, so please mark uh, uh, your calendars with the next event. You see it's already on the 18th of April, the virtuous circle of knowledge and, um, and innovation. And uh, so with that, um, I think that is all uh, for, for, for tonight. I would like to uh, uh, thank everyone for being here. I uh, wish you a good night, a safe return home, and i um, looking forward to see you numerous at the next occasion. Merci thank beaucoup. you.